We were on a philosophical journey in search of the remains of a tiny hut lived in by one of the 20th century's most influential philosophers. Well, can they stop and pet them? I mean, I don't know if it's going to be pet sheep. Yes, yeah. Can they get out? As we drove the six hours north from Oslo, it became clear that this was a land where the journey refused to fall service to the destination. It's the Sonja Fjord. This is the longest fjord, I think, in Norway. Or deepest fjord, I think it's the longest. This is longest. Fjord, yeah. I don't know, maybe you can get out of those things up above, right? Yeah. One hundred years ago, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein traveled for two days by boat before spending 14 hours on a train to reach the area. There was plenty of raw nature in his native Austria, but Wittgenstein wasn't in search of landscape, but exile. The sheep just walking along. <laughs> With his flight north, Wittgenstein became part of a long tradition of thinkers seeking geographical isolation to create intellectual space. Wow, these people are going fast. Going fast. Yeah. Whoever is unwilling to descend into himself, he said, because it is too painful, will of course remain superficial in his writing. Woo! I'm pretty scared of it to go down all the way. The place Wittgenstein chose to build his refuge was at the end of the longest and deepest fjord in Norway, the Sonja Fjord. We spent the night in the valley below Wittgenstein's cabin. The Vosbachen camping was near the trailhead leading to the hut. And it was an informal base camp for Wittgenstein seekers. Also staying here was a group run by artists from Oslo who had organized a weekend of activities to alert their fellow Norwegians of what was now a mostly forgotten ruin. You know, I've never been here before today. We read about it and then we found out that it hasn't been used that much, so we thought we should, we should do some kind of event that used the space. Yeah, yeah, there you are. So? Yes. Let's go. Off we go. What is it? Thank <laughs> you.
We're walking up to Wittgenstein's uh, ruin. Yeah, he had a cabin there, and most people in Norway doesn't know that that he's actually sat there and wrote a lot of uh, a lot of his work. He went on a vacation in 1913 in Norway, and then he came with this idea that he should find a quiet spot to get some peace. I think he thought it was nice and quiet and people didn't know him. I think he liked that. You know, you have a person, a very refined person from Vienna, belonging to one of the richest families in Europe in the beginning of the 20th century. And if you see that success, economic success, is not happiness since, you know, was dealing with suicide in his family. You probably do need some space. I think some people need also the physical, not only the psychological, but the physical space. Wittgenstein contacted the consul and he knew a guy who was a farmer up here. He knew of a spot that he could come and write. <laughs> so he went there and worked and then he started planning the smith here. Um, there's a there was a marker. I'd already gotten lost out here once this morning. There is no map to a site that isn't visible from down below. Do you see anything in there? Do you see it? You do see something eventually. Do you see it? The trail has only a couple of markings along its entire length up the mountain. And it sometimes disappears into land that is still being farmed. If you want to reflect on yourself, the less social layers you have to deal with in an everyday basis, the more raw material and calmness you have to just dedicate all your efforts to any creative task. Despite Spiena and Cambridge connections, Cambridge was the faculty with the biggest and most famous philosophy department. And he didn't stay there. And there he goes to the remotest part of Europe just to try to probably put a dent on philosophy. I can easily see why somebody would come here to try to contemplate and, you know, reflect. Especially if you are trying to do analytical philosophy in a very fundamental way, almost as fundamental as children would just consider language. <laughs> That's not the cabin, though. <laughs> That's not it? No, no, no. It's ruins, only ruins. He would try to find out the, the true meaning of words and the relationship of our uh, ourselves. So sometimes, uh, when you want to know the why a stone is a stone or why a rock is a rock or why a person is a person or why you call a feeling one way or another, depending on the language you are using, sometimes it's probably more engaging to be somewhere in nature. Do you know much about Wittgenstein? I knew that he was here before the war. Uh -huh. And uh, also a little about his rich family and <laughs> yeah, 
I was trying to, to understand some of his theories and it was very, very hard. Yeah. So yeah. I need some more time to... Yeah. But it's all, all about very much uncertainty. <laughs> yeah, that nothing is, is a fixed knowledge, seems like. Yeah. Everything is in flux and moving and constant changing. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, yeah. that's how I read it, anyways. Mm. I can uh, imagine that when, when he walked out here, all by himself, he, th he probably thought, oh, finally, no people. Here I can, my head can rest, you know? Yes. Now I can think my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, so maybe he had to come out here to really... Mm -hmm. Peace and, and really have time to think mm -hmm. all these intricate thoughts. I'm not seeing that. Oi! 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 Yeah. You could? Yeah, yeah. Ah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, not too fond of carrying water. Mm. Yeah. Mm The cabin Wittgenstein built here, high above the fjord, measured just seven by eight meters. Today the wood structure is gone, and the stone foundation is being taken over by the surrounding nature. He actually placed the hut just in front of the town. So he would probably look out of the window and he would see some civilization close enough but far enough. It's sort of similar to Thoreau's idea. He was in the woods and he was in nature, but he never left Concord. You know, he was within walking distance from neighbors. So I think. Uh, Wittgenstein did the same here. He never left civilization entirely, yet he wanted some space. And that space was, you know, a couple of miles of fjord <laughs> between him and, and town. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I ate it all. I ate it all. Wittgenstein came from the richest family in Austria at the time and he inherited a lot of money and became one of the richest people in the whole of Europe, much like Lord Byron and could do whatever he wanted, but uh, he, choose, he chose to give away his inheritance. And while he was here in Norway, he came upon this idea that he should take a vacation from Cambridge. He was choosing between going to Russia and being a factory worker or uh, going to Norway, some secluded place, I guess. This is part one of the project Wittgenstein on vacation. It's called Little Austria because Wittgenstein himself Hold this space for Little Austria. How? 
shall I start? The Bertrand blah blah. Bertrand. I don't know why we are here, but I know it is not perhaps to enjoy ourselves. That is one of the reasons I left Cambridge in the first place. I feel as though I'm suffering from spiritual constipation. Or is it just my imagination? Like when you're gagging, even though there's nothing left in there. Wittgenstein thought he was prostituting his mind to all the intellectuals in Cambridge. He wanted just to be alone and he's one of these guys that when he's together with others he just felt that they were taking his energy in some sense. It's always difficult talking to people who don't fully understand you. You always feel like a fool. Or at least I do because it keeps happening to me here. I can either go along with it and accept this rather embarrassing moment of miscommunication. Or one could go into total retreat and alienate oneself from the world. I choose the latter, of course. I have not and will not let this break me. There are those people who simply are too weak to break down. And I think I am one of those people. The only thing that might break in me is my sanity. And I fear this deeply. It terrifies me. And so he lived here off and on from 1914 until the 1950s. His longest stay was in 1936 to 37. It was 15 months. And he lived here in total seclusion without some few people that came to visit him. There is nobody here. But one can go alone, insane alone, all the same. What am I so afraid of? I know I am alone. Still, I keep looking around me, as if to check if somebody's watching. He scrutinizes his own life continuously to try to, to find ways of living that would be in accordance to his thoughts and his written texts. It seems to me that in every culture one stumbles upon a chapter called wisdom. And then I know exactly what follows. Vanity of all vanity, all is vanity. And I am discovering here my exile. Nothing is as difficult as not deceiving oneself. How impenetrably hard it is to know oneself. To honestly admit to oneself what oneself is. He says that uh, to have the good life, you have to see your life in the eyes of eternity. And he uses eternity in the sense uh, Spinoza uses it, which is in the moment, which is lost in the moment. So you see something with the whole world as a background. It's about having such a forceful expression that you kind of mellow out everything else and this is nothing he, he he doesn't believe in concepts and theories so he doesn't put forward a theory of how and that is perhaps the nicest part of it he, he doesn't claim to know how to do this but when i think that human beings are capable of letting themselves go and you know totally give in to impulses and in many ways, I see this as a higher form of life. I think this was a place where he could just be with himself and in a sense try to find some kind of uh, spiritual awakening. I don't think that is a strange thing at all. But it's more his strange mixture of being a Puritan, analytic, logic, philosopher and then at the same time being inspired by this prophetic spiritual mm -hmm. silence where everything of value is unsayable. It is maybe his most uh, famous uh, sentence that for what you cannot say you have to keep quiet.
Leo Tolstoy, one of Wittgenstein's greatest influences, wrote for one of his characters in Anna Karenina, he did not like talking and hearing about the beauty of nature. Words for him took away the beauty of what he saw. Before his death, Tolstoy had made plans to retire to a small hut. There is a longer story, a longer story about thinkers just going to nature and staying there and thinking back from the classics all the way to the contemporary society. And uh, now it's becoming more and more prevalent since urban is taking a lot of room. With internet everywhere and s smartphones, it's very easy to be very connected. So real withdrawal is, is going to be probably a luxury.